Um, I'm so excited to be here with my colleague Pranav Jani, The Ohio State University. Um, my goodness, um, book <laughs> Decentering you. Rushdie. You've got all these, oh my, I don't know, like Yale, Indiana, Brown, all these really like impressive things, Pranav. <laughs> but of course, maybe even most impressive is um, you know, New Jersey and your connection uh, there, but um, you're really important. You're really important, constant, you know, pounding of pavement as an activist, whenever and wherever you see wrongs being done, wherever, whenever you see rights being pulled from us, from Brown people from people in general, uh, really, um, it's a it's a big honor to consider you a friend as well as a colleague. Oh, this is you're, you're so kind, and you know I do what I can, and I uh, appreciate it, everything you're saying. I'm, I mean, you know, this is a big thing for me uh, to be on your show and talk to your students and others who may listen to this. Um, given all of your work in comics and in ethnic studies and, you know, setting the paradigm for how we talk about these things. So, so I'm just happy to be here and, and, you know, let's, and, and, and I'm excited to talk about this show. You know, it's, it's really, it's really wonderful. Yeah. So, Thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> Pranav, what would, how would you, I mean, you teach these, you know, these amazing classes on post-colonial studies, critical ethnic studies, um, I know that you're very grounded in kind of mat a materialist approach as well as close mm -hmm. readings. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, how would you, you know, I'm, t I'm teaching it with my students at UT. What, like, how would you go, like, how would you teach this in your classroom, I guess, as an opener? Oh, yeah. Well, can I just tell you that I have no idea because there's all those frameworks and all of those are important. We'll talk about them. But the first way I approach Ms. Marvel is as a South Asian American myself who never, never would have imagined in a million years that we would have a South Asian Muslim superhero. Um, I watched it with my teenage kids you know, one of them 16, the exact age of the protagonist. Mm. And we were all just enthralled. We couldn't ever imagine. And when I say we, we're a Hindu Indian family. Mm -hmm. If we're Pakistani, if we're Muslim, it's mm -hmm. even more. And people have written about it and talked about it. And people should go and make sure they hear podcasts and read articles by Pakistani Indian, you know, by Pakistani Muslim women um, talking about this because that experience is even more specific. But even hold back from that identity to see, actually, can I say, to see the similarities between how we grew up and how we live and the community depicted, you know, the mm -hmm. way that, and, and it's not just like, the over, you know, the, the kind of, the stuff you, that's hit, you, you know, that's apparent to everyone. It's stuff that's just silent. The gestures of family members, their reactions to things that are said feel like, oh, that's our family. Um, the kind of music that blares from their cars as they go by, you know, and that's not commented on, but when we see it, it's not just, background flavor either you know you recognize the songs you recognize the references to the to the movies you know that they're talking about and so this sense that some of our inner lives are being depicted for everyone to see but not in an exoticizing wow look at those people not in that kind of way but in a sort of here's who we are and here's our life. And this is not going to be a documentary. It's still a fiction. And we're going to go, not going to explain everything. We're just going to carry on. Uh, and then to, to feel that we're part of the audience being addressed, not just sort of the mainstream or the non-Deshi or South Asian community or 
you know, we're just kind of watching other people learn about our communities. No, as if we're also being invited in because it's for us too. That experience was just so profound that uh, I have to sit and think like, how am I going to bring an academic lens to it? Because <laughs> that's where it hit me first, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's always uh, it, that next step is it's <laughs> always difficult, right? Because um, yeah, there's like the d the dazzle of finally kind of you know um uh, you know being seen um and also celebrating those who haven't been seen being seen right um right. yeah no definitely so um well gosh you know there was i know there was a lot of t talk about how um and you know there's always the toxics the kind of comics gate stuff where right. you know the kind of the white the whiteness out there that has become it has such a fragile hold now on mm -hmm. kind of popular cultural creation is mm -hmm. always pushing against anything that's you know um, diverse and and appropriately different but um like the little mermaid you know, stuff and those backlashes right yeah, yeah yeah definitely yeah so um you know here we have we have this you know wonderful character as you mentioned created by a uh, pakistani british you know as the kind of you know the the main creative force behind it writers in the room also you know south asian um including of course uh sana amanat who was recognized by, by obama um and there's there was still a, there's some tension out there i felt like when i hopped into some of the social media feeds about you know superheroes and then being connected anchored in you know 42 and the british you know that mm -hmm. that moment when the british were losing their mm -hmm. this this power hold on india um, the arbitrariness of the lines that were drawn and then the terrible suffering horrors and violence of the partition can i don't know can you talk about that a little bit from your side of things yeah 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 so i haven't seen some of those debates uh, and to tell you the truth i've been i've been kind of i i saw that you know um that on the imdb and stuff like that mm -hmm. you know there was a, a sort of a pile on to give it like number you know one a, a one ranking and you know all of that has the impact and so i haven't been paying attention to that as much um but the stuff about the history i don't know if there's been a backlash about the history and the way it talks about history but i've been kind of looking at it from the inside mm -hmm. to try to you know to try to ask how it does look about talk about the history um, if I can talk about that, I, I felt that was fascinating. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I cried. Mm -hmm. In those later episodes where it kind of talks about partition, um, I mean, I mean, I, I just, I just cried. I just mm -hmm. partly it was like, I never imagined that partition would be talked about in this way. Um, you know, the kind of, it's not that they did a full history and why it happened and this mm -hmm. and that. It's not that they did, they did that kind of thing again, right? They, it's a fiction, not a, Mm -hmm. not a documentary right it's not a historical it's not national geographic or something like that and you know it kind of in but it but it gives you enough where it invites people to say well why don't you see why why this event is the event to focus on for the for the for that kind of traumatic um and dramatic you know instances of the history of this family right um, and, and it kind of invites you to do that. And it gives you enough of a sense of, you know, why that might be so traumatic. 
So this idea that, um, and, 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 I, and I went to, uh, you know, to look at one of my, my Facebook friends posts, um, Darakshan Raja, who's, who's Pakistani American and director of Muslims for Just Futures. Um, and, and she talked about that, you know, she said, uh, I'm still in disbelief that MCU went there. Um, in order to understand the violence of the partition, there's a power to having it be included. Um, you know, I, I cried <laughs> because when you have Muslim family members who resisted the British colonial rule, fought side by side, and then literally overnight were forced onto the last trains to make it back alive into the newly formed Pakistan, right? And, and, and just like, just like, to have that experience depicted. And then she also connects, and I was also thinking about, and then what does that mean to talk about current persecution of Muslims under the Hindu fundamentalist government in India and how that also resonates? And then to, to, to refer to that history and bring it into the story of this character and her family and, and it's kind of the kind of tectonic kind of events mm -hmm. you know, that happened for them, right? Um, it was just profound to see, uh, and uh, I mean, the, if people don't understand what the trauma is, or maybe the quote I gave, uh, you know, explains it. But just to just to put it this way, British India, right? British India extends across from what is now Pakistan all the way to what is now Bangladesh. And so its border on one hand is Afghanistan, right? It's all the way there. And then on the other hand is Myanmar or Burma, you know? And then to think about all of that as one space. So when the anti-colonial movement arose, you know, the nationalist movement, the anti-colonial movement um, arose, one of its big questions is how do we bind together these different communities and these different regions. The question of Muslim and Hindu unity became central to that question, but that wasn't the only question. It was also about other religions, other regions, especially because they all speak different languages. So just to kind of, um, just to kind of contextualize it a little bit, what we get here is a story of partition from a Punjabi, Muslim point of view, because Punjab, that region gets divided into Pakistan, right? Then the partition is also happening on the other side in Bengal. And that, you know, produces what becomes Bangladesh, but initially is East Pakistan. So you have this ridiculous idea, ridiculous in the sense of a country whose two wings are separated by a thousand miles with their arc enemy in between. It's a recipe for disaster, just like the British left with partition in Ireland and in Palestine. It's a recipe for disaster. It's not a solution, right? So in this kind of traumatic event, so all of a sudden, if I can take another minute here um, on this. So the demand for Pakistan comes out of a feeling that Muslims will only be second class citizens in the new India. Because when you look to the nationalist leaders, even in even though they're not the open right wing Hindu, Hindu fundamentalists, even the mainstream Congress leaders, there's a Hindu idiom. And there's this notion of a Hindu idiom, India. So you have a lot of Muslims within the Congress and the secular movement, you know, for India. But there's this increasing feeling that we will be second class citizens, the, the demand for Pakistan as a separate place grows. I, I want to acknowledge that that's where it comes from. But one of the results is a heightening of sectarian divisions as well, right? And so in that sense, you know, in that sense, it becomes actually a story about the failures of independence. In that sense, it just recognizing partition makes the idea that India's was a nonviolent revolution, not just ludicrous, but actually an erasure of so much violence, 10 million people displaced, 1 million people killed. So the stories that they're giving of that last train into Pakistan, right? 
And then you can tell a reverse story, the last train into India of Hindus and Sikhs. Here the focus is last train of Muslims into Pakistan. People having to flee, because if I don't get into Pakistan, I'm going to now be this extreme minority, right? So that story of the violence and then communalist, you could call fascistic forces, targeting those trains to say, we're going to have a train full of corpses that when it arrives on the other side, it's going to be a train full of corpses to send a message. So when Sana and all escape from that, mm. they're escaping from being killed. Mm. But you're still, even if you're alive, you're in a country that's been marked on both sides of the border with that kind of violence. Mm. So even surviving that kind of violence doesn't make you free from that kind of violence. Mm. So that's just to speak a little bit to the trauma that's underlying mm. all of this. You know, mm -hmm. again, focuses on, on Pakistan as it should be with this story, but it's a sub, sub, subcontinent, entire subcontinent is in trauma, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so that's part of why when I read this and, and, and when I seen around, many of our reactions was just like, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. they put this in mm -hmm. Marvel? <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, in Marvel like that. I went on for a while, but just to give some of the historical context and why, you know. So, yeah, so no, I think we're all kind of hungry for this, actually. I think, um, <clears throat> I mean, if I'm going to be honest, it's certainly in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, um, you know, we're hungry for this kind of deep, the, these deeper anchors for, you know, characters, anchors in in deeper history and connection to that history. Um, I think certainly if I'm reading my students right, they're, you know, they're entertained for the most part by the movies, um, but they're, it, it doesn't do much more than that. Whereas something like this, my sense um, from, you know, our class thus far is that, you know, it, it gives it gives something that they are really hungry for. I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you, Pranav, you know, in, in episode five when it opens and it's sort of this black and white and then kind of sepia colored sequence of images, really smart way of kind of mm -hmm. bringing audiences up to speed on the British colonization and, and violence and then Gandhi and the anti-colonial movement. Um, it, uh, I, at a certain moment, we go very quickly from Hindus and Muslims being neighbors, just mm. as you know we are in the U U United States, um, in our different communities, neighbors, um, to a kind of fear that starts to drive a wedge between communities, for families, friends. Um, and I just wondered, you know, what, you know, what kind of seeds, what kinds of thinking? I mean, I, I know that we see it here in fear mongering and scapegoating, but um, how is it working? Um, because we don't get that. Uh, we don't get it. We don't get a lot of depth there, which I understand. It's, you know, still a Marvel kind of thing, but. Right, right. You know, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, so. I think one thing that's really, really important to remember, and, and you and you gesture towards this as well, which is that these divisions are are products of history, right? And they're they're things that change over time. And the word you use, wedge, is perfect. You know, it, there's a um, there are underlying differences between communities and all of that. People have different, you know social kind of unspoken or spoken rules about who you ought to marry and who you ought to love and you know even defining a community often gets centered around family and marriage and and, and this and that you know so those divisions are always sitting out there right but what is it that makes them turn towards violence right not just well we're different we'll get together, we'll pass you in the street, but we'll be our own community. That kind of stuff happens all the time. And it speaks to some underlying difference. But what makes it like, oh, I better fear for my life because my neighbor now 
you know, might actually lead, lead, lead a, you know. On the one hand, we have those stories, right? The neighbor turns against you. On the other hand, we always have in these instances, the other stories, you know, the, in a Hindu majority area, the Hindu neighbor who protects their Muslim neighbor, Muslim majority area protects their Hindu. And those stories are always there too. Um, and they're always part, uh, part of it. Um, and and I think I think you have a combination in this situation of a, a whole number of things, right? Um, well, first of all, you have the you have you have moments of of unity. So in the 1920s, the link between kind of Muslim and Hindu sort of aspirations are are really joined together, mm-hmm. but they're often joined together on the basis of religious kind of we're separate but we're joined together there's that kind of feel nevertheless you have the non-cooperation movement you have tremendous hindu muslim unity it's the heights of hindu muslim unity um, at that time right so the non-cooperation movements means we refuse to uh, uh to, to to study in british schools we used to refuse to work at british jobs you know leave your jobs leave your schools things like that you know and that you see Hindu and Muslim participation in huge numbers. You had a separate group called the Muslim League formed in 1906 because those same fears of being second class citizens are there. But they actually often strategically at different times work very closely with Congress or other things. Sometimes they work separate. So this kind of thing is always going on. But um, you have other points of unity. You see unity in the 1930s. You see unity in the 1942 you know, um, uprisings as well. But there's also a dwindling of that that happens, you know. Um, there's times when there's elections. So even in colonial India, they had elections at times because they the British wanted to show that they're involving people, you know. So the question of the movement was, do we boycott the elections or do we use the elections to push our purpose? These debates are going on. But sometimes you'd find a Muslim majority in uh, place in which the Muslim League runs a candidate and then there's a Muslim representative of the Congress who runs, and the Congress person wins in the same area that 10 years later becomes a site of sharp conflict, right? So the questions, and people can read the histories and all that. So the, so the first thing is to remember that these things are not natural and endemic about Hindu Muslim always going into violence, but they're things where differences are turned into violent separations, right? Uh, as you were mentioning, so so there's a wedge issue, you know, and that's where the British divide and conquer politics comes in, because they would definitely play one community off the other, right? Their argument was, oh, we would leave, but you all aren't ready. You'll be at each other's throats. And of course, when you have partition violence, we do see people at each other's throats, right? So empire constantly puts that as a justification. And then those forces of, of splitting communities you know there's there's people who have interest in splitting communities too you know um they uh they take advantage of those situations uh fears you know scapegoating all of that comes together um so that that's what happens in that case but what's really beautiful in here say i hope a number of things a number of things for the outcome of this miss marvel because it's not just a marvel thing (laughs) It's way beyond. Because if you took the logic of it, right? If you took the logic of it, 1942, push for independence in India. What does that mean? That means weakening the British effort in World War II. Where would Captain America be in that, in that equation? He'd be on the other side. <laughs> so if you push the logic of this, it doesn't really fit in the Marvel universe. This is a, this is a text that celebrates the 1942 uprising, the Quit India movement, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Hassan, right? The the uh, mm-hmm. Aisha's puppet is at the, the is part of the like it's significant that they say India 1942 because that was one of the spikes of the movement. You know, during World War II, that basically people said we're not going to fight World War II because we understand that Britain is fighting fascism, but people said we have to first fight the fascism in front of us. How can Britain be claiming to fight fascism when they're drafting us into their army to fight their wars? They're taking funds, right? There's a famine in Bengal because the British are taking taking rice and food 
they're saying we're going to repurpose it to fuel, you know, to supply the, the armies in World War II. And the nationalists, to some nationalists are like, we're against Hitler. We're anti-fascist. We shouldn't kick the British down now, you know, because they're actually doing something good. And others are like, no way. These are the fascists at home. So we're going to fight them right now. We're going to fight recruitment. We're against, you know, the recruit, all the World War II stuff, right? So where would Captain America be in that? You know, we know where he'd be. He'd be on the other side, right? So, so we think about this. So there's complications Marvel has by celebrating India 1942 here with us on. There's historical complications here. But, you know, we look at it, we love it, right? And there you have... It, and that's not a, it's not a, it's not random, a random date that they pick, right? And then when they pick 1949 for when Najma comes back and finds Aisha and tries to get the bangle and all that. Now that's a post partition situation and it's a very different kind of moment, you know, I think. So there's something, something further to do into that. But what, what I'm trying to say is like, they don't give you all the history, but they're paying attention to the moment where I think Hassan being involved in that struggle is quite significant. It's a different moment. It's not the moment of the, the trains full of corpses. It's the moment where there's some hope that you can actually build something different. And that's defeated, you know, that's defeated and that goes down. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> oh my goodness. I I'm learning so much with you, Pranav. Thank you so much. Um, um let, Cheryl. Yeah. let me let me ask too, there's a moment um you know, with Nani, when she says to, uh, well, there's two things I want to ask you that are related. But the first one is, you know, she's, she's speaking with Kamala, and she's like, you know, um, look, at my age, you know, I'm still trying to figure out who I am. Mm -hmm. My passport's Pakistan, says Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, Pakistani, and but my roots are in India. Right. Um, and then oh. she literally says the border is marked by blood and pain. And of oh. course, we know that that border was imposed on her and on so many others. Tell me about that. What what did that do for yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I want to talk about this. And uh, it re all of this is resonating on the U.S. side of questions as well. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we'll have time for that, too. But I think what's great here. What's great here is that when we think of, you know, ethnic studies and immigration and all that, right, in the U.S., this question, this image of having a passport but being from another place and all that usually comes up from the point of view of immigration, right, Not to the U.S. when we talk about it in that context, right? And here we're talking about it in South Asia. And it just, I think, it, I think first of all, right, in a broadest way, even if you don't know anything about the history, it just tells us about how the movement of people and migration historically has often been, you know, sure there's voluntary movement, but often it's forced movement of one kind or another with so much pain around it, right? You know, whether we're talking about the migrants that these Florida and Texas, you know, using them as political tools, putting them on buses and planes and shipping them wherever they want, you know, where they want for their games as if they're not human beings. You know, there's that marking, those markings of that violence. Um, and then I think here we see another marking, right? Like even if people wanted Pakistan or felt they needed it for safety and all that, that marking that my roots are in a place where I can no longer visit, right? And that that marks the history of so many people in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in India, um, that you were forced to leave. You know, there's one poet, uh, Manto, um, a Muslim poet. He uh, is M-A-N-T-O at the time of partition. And he was secular. He was an atheist. <laughs> You know, uh, he didn't want to leave Bombay. He was like, I don't want to go to Pakistan. You know, I want to stay in India. India, at least nominally, is secular. You know, and Pakistan was saying we're an Islamic Republic. I, I don't want to go to Pakistan. His friends are like, you have to go. You're not safe here, right? And then he goes to Pakistan. And, you know, he, um, 
he has a tough life, you know, and, 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 and he, he, he dies in some sad circumstances. Um, but, and, and his writings about partition, oh my God, um, it, it's, it, it blows your mind because he, he talks about that, that violence, but he almost, in a kind of a sarcasm and a humor that almost makes you kind of laugh while you're reading it. You know, he says things like, it was only the sixth bullet that was fired that killed an old woman you know, that the, that the shooter thought, hmm, maybe this isn't the right thing I'm doing, you know, stuff like that. So this Manto is an amazing writer, but that's an example of like that forced, mi forced migration, right? You have to go because you fear you'll be killed otherwise. Um, and so this, we get a sense of, of that, you know, we get a sense of that, like just a divided self, right? Um, and uh, writers like um, Kamila Shamsi, who's a Pakistani uh, British, I think she lives in the U.S. now. Um, her novels, she has a novel called Cartography, but she does this in many of her novels, where she actually talks about the divisions within Pakistani society between people, the muhajir, I think is the word, you know, the people, you know, who are people who are marked as like they came from India, they're not real Pakistanis. Right. And then there's the people who always lived in that geographical space before the division who get seen as like the real ones. Right. Uh, and, and the Muhajirs have stereotypes as like, oh, the penniless beggars coming from nowhere, where, of course, they came leaving their property and so much, you know, with often family members who have been killed with so much trauma. Right. And so Kamala Shamsi talks about the divisions that happened within Pakistani society as well, um, because these migrants Right, are seen as as others and don't simply blend in because they're supposed to belong there right because they're muslim and and therefore pakistani right is the assumption and so so there's touching so that that story you know they didn't have to have that character written that way you know mm -hmm. but that emphasis on that and the lines you read really speak to that history but again without giving a lecture about it so people can go into it more you know if they like Mm -hmm. Yeah, it also, as you were speaking, I was thinking about um, the character Nakia and, you know, yeah. where she she's like, look, I'm either too white or too ethnic. Right. And, you know, putting, you know, putting this um, headscarf on, you know, I feel like me. Um, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that that character is very interesting, right? Um biracial character and then um she, she's a close friend but not pakistani right she's she's i think she's lebanese in the show but she's um turkish in the comics is what i've heard i'm not that familiar with the comics but that's what i've mm -hmm. heard mm -hmm. um, they tried to match her identity in the show with the character's identity a little bit mm -hmm. um that, that that stuff is always interesting to look at but i think her her figure is so important right um, and it really opens up, and I, I think it would be interesting to see how non-Pakistani or non-South Asian Muslims read the show, you know, in, in relationship to how Pakistani and South Asian Muslims read the show. I think that would be an interesting thing. But here, at least, you get this sense of a Muslim community that actually crosses those national borders, you know, and 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 includes people across, and, and in you know, various Muslims, com Muslim communities that I work with, sometimes those connections happen. And sometimes there are divisions, you know, um, sometimes there are divisions of language even, um, you know, and, 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 and race and culture where different Muslim communities have an openness towards each other, but mm -hmm. have their own separate mosques and their own sep separate areas. And so here, there's a certain acceptance, right, of, uh, of, um, I'm forgetting her name. Nakia. Uh, mm -hmm. of Nakia, right, right. There's a certain acceptance of her. And the role that she plays in the in the becoming part of the board, right? And kind of mm -hmm. saying the old the old uncle's network uh, is not gonna fly, right? And the way she brings gender issues into it, while you know, being also representative of kind of hijabi Muslims as well, you know, I think is really important. Um, so that that decision of you know, uh, Kamala doesn't wear a hijab. Mm -hmm. You know, Nakia does. Those are those are other kinds of decisions going on there. I think it was really important 
for many reasons to have um, Nakia there. I was a little sad that I'm, I'm glad they addressed it a little bit that uh, th that they were close, but she didn't know about the superpowers till too late in the game. I was like, hmm, what's that about? But um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, those are those are. You know, those are all kinds of things going on. Yeah. Pranav, what is, you know, the journey home? And I know that kind of is significant for many of us. And especially, mm -hmm. you know, once you've come into the means to be able to afford the journey to the same right. motherland, right? Right. Um, to, right. To, and for Kamala, that's a really important, well, that is the journey for her in many ways um, yeah, to, to yeah. connect with, you know, Nani and uh, yeah. her roots and everything. What can you share a little bit of that? I'm um, even on even on a personal level, maybe. I don't yeah. Know. Oh. Um, well, there's so much there. So so just first on the level of plot, the fact that. Kamala ends up being. You know, you know, that whole thing of like, like, we're the ones we've been waiting for, <laughs> you know, Kamala ends up being the one who saved her great grandmother, mm -hmm. right? Or her grand, yeah, her great, wait, no, her grandmother. Kamala ends up being yes. the one who saved yep. her grandmother. Yep. And, and, and to show her, 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 her great grandfather, her way to find her grandmother, right? Mm -hmm. Oh. That's there's something beautiful, beautiful in that. That I think you know, it's not just a journey home, but you have a place there. You know, there's something beautiful in that, and mm. it's um, you know, it's uh, you know, you you have a place in this history. You know, it's not just about something that happened to your, you know, uh, ancestors. Mm. You have a place, and it. it's alive for you. And I think that does a lot both in the context of current victimization of Muslims in India, for example, but I think it also in the 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 um the Islamophobia and the post 9-11 surveillance and demonization of Muslims, right? Which this whole show, which this whole show is probably unique in the mainstream landscape to just be like, no, <laughs> you know, the, the depiction of that in the fight with the cops, right? Um, where they literally do are doing what they did after 9-11 which is target muslim teenagers right and go into communities and all that um people have debates about whether the show is ultimately kind of too nice to the cops and the agents but that's the whole question do you have a depiction of that and you have a call standing up against that and all that. so i think like this whole issue of her going back home i was thinking of it in terms of like you have a place in that history because it's resonating with the now you know, that that history is not just an ancient thing, but it's part of you, and it's what you need to know in order to take on the present. You know, so mm -hmm. I thought that was, that resonated in that way for me, and it was very powerful. Um, it really roots her, right? Mm -hmm. You know who you are and all that. But then, just like, and many people have commented on this. Um, it's. You, you end up, again, a class position. There, there were times where I used to get mad at my parents. Like, how come we didn't go to India for nine years? We missed so many things, you know? Later on, I realized they couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. you know? They sent me once alone when I was nine. I went to India, visit my grandparents, whatever. And uh, I realized later that they could only afford one ticket at that time, you know? Uh, even though they were in, you know, graduate school and this and that, like they they couldn't afford, you know, three tickets to India, you know, that kind of thing. So that that look of going there and then seeing this place that you're connected to and seeing these people that are yours. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how many times in my life did I actually see my grandfather at 11? <laughs> you know? maybe sometimes for a month or a few weeks or whatever at, at a chunk, but maybe there were 11 or 12 separate times that I saw him. You know what I mean? So, so there's a kind of like, we're linked where this is our family, this is our place, but you might not see each other often. And this is of course, well before Zoom or anything like that. You know, you literally won't see people, right? So 
So that's a profound thing in that the, the, the show kind of conveys that sense of both familiarity and distance. But again, because South Asians are part of the audience, you know, it's not just for other people. Mm -hmm. It does that in all of those scenes in Karachi and stuff. You know, I, I think we probably have seen Karachi in some James Bond movie. I can't remember. Maybe I'm wrong. But an American show goes to Karachi and doesn't just turn it into this exotic place. Mm -hmm. It's just completely different. It's different, but it feel it feels different in the way that when you watch a South Asian show made in South Asia, and the way they show it, is a sense of a sure it's different, but it's it's normal. Mm -hmm. It's just another place, right? Rather than a exotic or poor or this or that, mm -hmm. in some kind of ridiculous way, you know. So it, so it felt very. It felt very real. <laughs> it all felt very, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it was it was amazing to see those mm -hmm. depictions. I think there's some issues that come up, like why are the red daggers there, and you know, there, there's some of that, some of that uh, conspiratorial stuff. You know, mm -hmm. might oh, right. fall into some of those old tropes about you know the East and the mystery mm -hmm. and all that. Even the bangle and stuff could fall into that. But I don't know. It doesn't feel like Aladdin's lamp. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels like even using the word Bengal, mm -hmm. which I don't know how common it is outside of South Asian circles, but that's the word we use. You know, you don't say bracelet. You don't say mm -hmm. whatever, just bangles, you know. So mm -hmm. some of that was so familiar. It was it was stunning. Yeah, uh, and I think it's I think you're right. I think it's because um, you know, the the writers give so much narrative space to allowing the location Karachi and its different locales to really breathe um, mm. to, for the sounds and the smells, mm -hmm. the sights, everything to, they allow that to happen and not in a forced way. And I think I think that's the big difference, you know, the James Bond exoticism versus writers yeah. in the room that are like, no, 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 we're not just going to have this as background, um, you know, um, tokens, you know, representation. Mm -hmm. We're going to allow this space to breathe in the way that it should. I also think your beautifully sort of insightful comment about the past living with us in the present and our discovery of of that in our own journeys um, as a way to kind of empower us, you know, forward, um, not just as a, as an atomized or singular, you know, person moving in the world, but someone who's also moving with a collective is yet another way that the writing and the show mm -hmm. um, disallows that kind of James Bond exoticism, you know? Right, right, right. No, I think that, yeah, no, I think that, um, it's always a trick. And let me just add one thing that sometimes second generation South Asians may make that same move when they go to South Asia. You know, um, like Jhumpa Lahiri as a writer, you know, I love her writing, et cetera. But in, in that collection, The Interpreter of Maladies, I feel like her weakest stories are the ones that take place in South Asia because there's a sense of not knowing the place. There's a little bit of exoticization, but mm -hmm. even in some of these sec in sec some second generation kind of texts, you see, you know, in order to get a seat at the table of the place called America, you also have to look at South Asia and other places as backward and this and that, you know, because I'm American, you know what I mean? And that move is made. So, so here, I think the the depiction of the immigrant parents, you know, so some places you read about, they'll be like the strict immigrant parents. And I guess they are in a, in a certain way. But in another way, they're not made out to be these kind of, you know, irrational, oppressive parents. You know, they're concerned about their daughter. You know, the whole Hulk, what, is it the Hulk costume that the dad puts on? You know, and me, by, me being closer in age to that dad, you know, I had a lot of, uh, uh, <laughs> I loved seeing him not demonized. You know what I mean? But 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 um, mm -hmm. Muniba, the mom, 
So yeah, Yusuf was not demonized, the dad. But Muniba, the mom, she is more strict, right? Um, but she's also not turned into someone who can't be spoken with, can't be. Done. So there's a, there's a way in which sometimes that kind of almost uh, exoticization or I don't know what's the right word, a condemnation or stereotyping of, you know, home sometimes happens through looking at the, the first generation immigrant parents as actually carrying over way too much of those ideas. And here they kind of make them, a, you know, more relatable, you know, they might have their particular, um, you know, things about curfew and this and that, but, you know, where are you going and you can't go and you need to study and whatnot. They have all that stuff, but they're not as sort of uh, authoritarian. I think there's something to that, you know, uh, and I, it, it might it might limit then some of, I think it's part of the community building project of the text. I think we see that with the Imam, with Sheikh Abdullah in the mosque, right? He's mm -hmm. not an authoritarian figure. It's possible though. I think in the context of demonization of Muslims, it's very important to have that. It's very important. It's very important to have Amir with this big beard mm -hmm. and his particular beliefs, which are different than his father's. I think it's important to have that figure and how he's funny and, and, and all that stuff. You know, he's a normal guy. Mm -hmm. He has particular ideas about religion and dress and all that. So I think all these things are important in the context of a demonized you know, population, you know. But it may also end up um, set, kind of settling too easily some of those debates that do come up, that are raised. It's good that they're raised. But they're sort of settled too easily. Debates around gender, debates about dress, mm -hmm. debates mm -hmm. about conflict, you know, um, that are very much part of people's lives as well. So I think mm -hmm. like there is a balance, right? There's a balance that's that's constantly made and different people will, I think, look at how that balance is made a little bit differently. But the explicit referent I see is that we're going to actually have some depictions of a diversity of Muslim characters who form a community and have that love and trust, you know, between them. You know, I think that's mm -hmm. what's behind how the imam is depicted and, and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, no. Yeah. And it's something that my students mention all the time, you know, even when we get something um, so carefully and kind of beautifully done that represents, a, you know, the diversity of community communities that have been otherwise either stereotyped or willfully kind of <laughs> obliterated um the big thing is we want more because you know six episodes of right. you know miss marvel kamala khan can't do everything <laughs> can't, can't do everything they tried to do too much there's some characters and plot lines that are just not developed as much you know and um, I, I think i think the strength is in the family relations and I'm sure some people who just wanted a superhero movie were like, you know, mm -hmm. more, you know, it's not a superhero. But like, honestly, the strength is in, you know, right? A, a, a brown girl from Jersey City can't be a superhero. Like, brown girl from Jersey City, like explaining that becomes the project, right? And you can't do everything else. Like, you know, what exactly is going on between the clandestines and the red daggers and mm -hmm. you know <laughs> i'm still trying to figure out like you know it you know is she a mutant or in you like i i don't mm -hmm. i don't know exactly where she falls on all that but it's almost yeah. like they gave that less of less of priority than like we're gonna go to karachi we're gonna talk mm -hmm. about partition you know? and yeah. that's where the depth from, you know and i love it i love it so I think um, we can end on this, Pranav. Uh, this has been just as as I thought it would be, absolutely mind blowingly, you know, oh. wide eyed, opening <laughs> everything. So thank you, thank you, Pranav. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really, really happy to talk about this. And let's see season two. Can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And maybe, although. Um, I, um, yeah, we'll see. I know that, you know, the MCU is really trying in its kind of bigger feature length films to be more inclusive. 
let's see what they do with Kamala, you know, um, because I'll be honest, like when they brought in, you know, America Chavez mm -hmm. in the last Doctor Strange, I was pretty disappointed. But we'll, we'll, we'll still give them, we'll give them a shot at it. But yeah, you know, these smaller, these kind of six episode runs might be our, our place, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, can I throw in one more thing? I, I just, I just wanted to, um, you know, to just say again that, um, you know, raising political critiques of what's depicted is still important even if we love the text and what it does. And it doesn't mean we're asking the text to do everything we want. No text ever does, but saying that there are important things. So I just wanted to say one thing, particularly because of the current state of Asian American politics, broadly speaking, you know, which is that when they depict that final battle scene and bravely, bravely talk about the post 9-11 context and, and how wrong it was in targeting entire communities and mosques and schools and neighborhoods, you know, deporting people, like all of that is referred to in that, right? But when they do that, there's a tendency to then protect the police by saying, you know, most, most of them are trying to protect the community and there's some bad cops, right? That we need to get rid of. And then, and then you do, right? The, the person who orders the thing is removed. And then the other person comes in, who I think is a person of color, um, you know, who comes in to lead the agents and all that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that move, right? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a few bad apples and we can get rid of them. Mm -hmm. it is in opposition to an abolitionist perspective, you know, that looks at the question of the state and the police um, and sees this as part of how, you know, how empire works and how policing works, um, regardless of who the individual police is, right? And so those kind of questions, like the, the, the arguments, of, you know, about Muslim feminism, you know, how would this imam be if some women decided to burn their hijabs in a big old fire, for example, right? Um, the imam is not the same as as the Iranian government, but mm -hmm. these protests are going on. The right wing loves these protests because anything that criticizes Iran is is a is a good thing <laughs> for them, right? Um, so, so how do we think about Muslim feminist arguments and and both mm -hmm. being part of religious communities and immigrant communities and also raising questions? How do we think about abolitionist politics in relationship to this brave depiction, you know, of and rejection of Islamophobia in this show? Those kind of questions could and should be part of part of how we look at this. Um, and we can still like <laughs> like mm -hmm. the show, you know, for mm -hmm. what it does. I just wanted to put this out there. It's my hope that this this is that um, this is the beginning of many such depictions, which can really open up. You know these larger questions. Wow, um, the beginning. Um, thank you so much, Pranav. Really amazing, and um, yeah, uh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for for inviting me, and so happy to happy to talk.